Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Black History Month lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce Sister Patricia Chappelle. She's a native of New Haven and a member of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. She holds a master's degree in social work from the Catholic University of America. Sister Patricia served as president of the National Black Catholic Sisters Conference from 1995 to 2001. She served as the first African-American executive director of Pox Christi from 2011 to 2019. She has also served in congregational leadership and is currently serving in leadership for the U.S. province of the Sisters of Notre Dame. In addition, Sister Patricia is co-coordinator of the Sisters of Notre Dame USA anti-racism team. Tonight, help me to welcome her as she addresses the topic, is building the beloved community an impossible dream? Good evening. Y'all can do better than that. Good evening. Good evening. All right. It, first of all, giving honor and praise to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am just so blessed to be here. More importantly, it's good to be home. You know, I, 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 I look at this uh, city now, and uh, I just live two blocks up off of Charles Street. Orchard Place, that's where I live, uh, and, and lived and have lived in that area um, most of my life. And I'm also blessed because tonight I also have my 89-year-old mom with me, uh, Miss Harris. So I'm happy. Y'all can give it up for my mom, y'all. <laughs> and again, I'm born and raised and bred at St. Martin de Porres Parish, 136 Dixwell Avenue. Um, so I have to give a shout out. Uh, to, to St. Martin de Porres uh, because it's because of that parish and that community that I know I'm able to stand here today. And also my good friend and ally, the pastor of St. Martin de Porres is also with us, Father Joseph Elko. <laughs> Within the African American tradition, before one can speak, one always needs to ask permission from the elders in order to speak. And so following that tradition, I basically am asking those of you who are my elders, may I have your permission to speak? Yes. Thank you. Oftentimes somebody will say, well, Patty, what if they say no? <laughs> I said, well, I just sit my butt down and when I find another occasion, raise my hand and say, may I now speak? So thank you so much. In progressive religious circles, you will often hear calls to build the beloved community. But I'm not sure, my sisters and brothers, we always appreciate the full historic resonance of that phrase. That term, beloved community, was coined by an early 20th century philosopher Josiah Royce. But most of us, most of us learned about the term, not from Royce, but from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who often spoke of the creation of the beloved community as his ultimate goal. As an early example, after the Montgomery bus boycotts, in speaking about the larger movement they were building, Dr. King said, the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. He further stated, my sisters and brothers, that building this beloved community requires the even harder work of reconciliation redemption, and being in right relationships. It is transforming opponents into friends. And looking at the climate of our church, our country, and our world, I cannot help but wonder, is the beloved community an impossible dream? Is the beloved community an impossible dream? Thus, 
the topic of my discussion tonight. I would like to begin examining our church with the gospel as a starting point. So I'm starting with the gospel. John 10.10. 10. For there we hear Jesus say, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. There were no exceptions to whom Jesus came to give life to. All were eligible. All were worthy. All were welcome. No one was outside the fullness of life. No one was judged inadequate. No one had to prove anything to qualify. For the fullness of life was theirs for the asking. For Jesus, every person from the womb to the tomb was to be treated with reverence and dignity because all of life was and is sacred. No one life is more meaningful or has greater value than another life. For example, at this moment, my sisters and brothers, if Pope Francis was to come into this room along with a death row inmate shackled and in leg irons, who do you think we would be running to greet first? Be honest and let's keep it real. Who would we be running to greet? If we're honest with each other, we would probably run to meet, meet the Pope. He's a decent man. He's a good brother. But yet, in, the, in essence, both of these persons are on an equal playing field. Both are worthy of the same respect and dignity. Amen? Because they are both human beings, what they have done or not done does not matter. The fullness of life is their birthright. Another passage is what Matthew records Jesus saying in chapter 6, verse 9. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. We all know the first part of the prayer, but what is significant is when Jesus, in addressing his father, says, may your kingdom, follow what I'm saying, not kingdom, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. For the creation of the beloved community is the dream of God to be actualized in the here and now, during our lifetimes. Somebody say amen. amen. Yet, we have participated in and witnessed how scripture was used as a weapon to keep enslaved persons passive, to keep people in their place, marginalized, and invisible. In short, to justify slavery. We have seen how scripture throughout the centuries has been used as a weapon. For the gospel that was preached oftentimes was to one for us to endure suffering now. So that when you die and you cross over, you experience liberation wearing your long white robe and your crown. But you see, this mindset, along with unjust systems, was the justification to black folks who never have received our 40 acres and a mule. An emancipation promise that I'm still waiting to receive. If you can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> How we have distorted that profound truth by teaching the community lies, that community lies on the other side, but that on this side, we will find only struggle, 
challenge, and pain. Jesus is saying that the kingdom, the beloved community, is available here and that all of our efforts should be made to have this come about. Don't have to wait till we die to see that, to be liberated. It is our moral responsibility to see that beloved community be created in the here and the now. Somebody say amen. amen. See, y'all, one thing about me, I, 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 I have to tell the truth and I keep it real. So if you all never invite me back, Sister Jennifer, it's okay. Because I done been put out of other places before. And I just shake the dust off my feet and keep on keeping on. Because I know where I come from. I know whose I am and who I am. How different our theologies would be today if that reality had been the focal point of all of our religious institutions, including our Catholic Church. But we have also participated in making people less than. Our churches have preached and sung all our welcome. Don't we get up there and sing all our welcome? And at the same time, those who are in authority have been given and have created a series of dogmas and rules that have placed people outside of the fullness of that life that the church claims we offer. It's no joke when we go into many of our churches on Sunday morning, it still is one of the most segregated times in this country. Can any of us imagine Jesus, Jesus in, his, in the preaching and the healing and in the feeding of the people, if Jesus decided to stop and started taking a, a census or started taking a poll on who is worthy to partake. Can you even imagine Jesus saying, don't anyone take this bread to eat if you are divorced or remarried, if you are transgender, if you are LGBTQ? Can you imagine that? That's not the Jesus that I have come to love. But in our institutions, we have placed these rules and dogmas in places where we have excluded folks from being part of our beloved community. So under the current conditions, yes, the beloved community is an impossible dream sometimes in our church in our beloved church, the church that I love, but the church that I say we have to tell the true truth. Then, my brothers and sisters, there's our country. This country founded on Christian principles and engraved on the Statue of Liberty. And what's on the Statue of Liberty? Here at our sea-washed, sunset gates, shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name mother of exile. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air bridge harbor that twins the city's frame. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempts toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. But currently, currently, the golden door has become a wall. Currently, the welcome has been replaced by executive orders. 
Those yearning to breathe free are being punished, imprisoned, and persecuted at our southern border. In a country that claims to be a democracy, we are seeing a rise in voter suppression, particularly in black, black and brown communities. We see redistricting taking place all around us. We see greater restrictions that people have to prove and bring forward so that they can exercise their right. We see lesser polling places available for folk. We see regentrification in our major cities. Oh, come on, y'all. We see re major regentrification. I live in DC right now. We see major regentrification going on. But you know something? I look in New Haven right now and see major regentrification taking place all around us. And so you can't help but wonder, how are we as communities of color to participate in this democracy? Have you noticed that all those women, children, and men being prevented from coming to the US are brown and black? There are no white people at the southern border of our country who are being detained. Trying to keep it real, church. The countries being refused visas to come to the US are all from the Middle East, Africa, and the Southern Hemisphere. This is not a coincidence. It is systemic racism at its finest. The rhetoric of hate is proclaimed and tweeted from high places. Truth is no longer recognized but distorted for political gains, while the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Without safety nets of employment, adequate health care, affordable housing, quality education, and just wages, people of color are left to fend for themselves. And if they die in the process, oh well. I do know that many poor whites find themselves in these situations, and they are certainly not to be dismissed or forgotten. But those who are unduly impacted and feel it the most are those who have lived with systemic injustice, Native Americans, African Americans, since this country was founded by and for white men. And then when white women received the vote, they didn't do not too much better. There are past and current laws enacted in this country that are meant to be a boot, a boot on the backs of people of color. Racism is institutionalized in this country with the social systems that are the fabric of our nation. And yet, even the most educated of us do not believe that there's any connection between human trafficking, immigrant and refuge detention, the plea of our DACA students and dreamers, current nuclear dump sites, gun violence, mass incarceration, the opioid epidemic, just to name a few. Those of us who are oftentimes so educated, we refuse to see the connections that those, those issues are connected and those issues are rooted in unjust systems that are embodied in systemic racism. 
It's no coincidence that the water crisis that continues to occur in Detroit and in Newark, two cities with high numbers of people of color, it is not a coincidence what happened after Hurricane Katrina to the people in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. It is not a coincidence that Puerto Rico is still devastated three years after Hurricane Maria, which took place in 2017. My sisters and brothers, we have to wake up and stay woke. So under the current conditions, yes, the beloved community is an impossible dream in our country. And then we look at our world. The climate crisis is killing precious life forms and taking a serious toll on all human forms of life. Nuclear proliferation and the upgrading of weapons of mass destruction is being bantered about like a game of chess. Threatening, bullying, name calling, and hate-filled challenges to annihilate other nations and people with war, engaged in war, is rampant. It seems that mediation, diplomacy, integrity, and reconciliation seem to be short in supply. And under the current conditions, yes, the beloved community seems to be an impossible dream in our world. But that is only half of the picture, my brothers and sisters. When I look around, I believe that I do see evidence that the beloved community is taking root, however slowly and painstakingly. My experience as I have moved about through the country is that I see young adults crave a spirituality that will help make sense out of the issues that you struggle with, both personally and collectively. I'm not referring to a traditional organized religion, although that can be a place to find some of the seeds of meaning. I'm referring to a deep longing, a craving that you have to make connections with a source greater than yourselves and with others who will support, challenge, and accept you as you are. My experience with millennials, the young adults, you are not put off or suspicious around issues of diversity. Rather, you look for, you welcome, enjoy, and embrace new people who come from different races, cultures, and backgrounds. For you, diversity enhances and does not evoke fear of the other. You are curious as to how other people live, govern themselves, and survive. What I see coming from our young adults is racial equity you are willing to talk about and you are willing to try to understand what that is all about. You have a strong desire to not only to talk to talk, but you have a strong desire to walk the walk. Do you realize that is a gift as well as a challenge that you possess? It is a gift in that it is a natural ability that you possess in not judging another by your own standards. It is, however, and will always be your greatest challenge. For you are privileged. If you're white, you are privileged. If you have an education, 
you are privileged. If you have an Ivy League education, you are very privileged. If you have health care, you are privileged. If you feel relatively assured of a job when you graduate, and that's not guaranteed even anymore, you might be privileged. And the list goes on and on. You will always benefit my sisters and brothers from your whiteness. For it is the air you breathe, and it is a dimension of your DNA. What you have to begin to look at is what is called internalized racial superiority. While there's nothing inherently wrong with privilege, it is the use of that power that will make you either a person of integrity or ruthless. Every time you feel above someone, it is the misuse of power. Whenever you objectify another, calling them you people, or referring to people as them, that is a misuse of power. When you perceive someone is lesser than you, when power is used to devalue or denigrate or undermine another person, your perceived authenticity becomes a wedge in the relationship. That is a misuse of power. Whenever you refuse to listen to another or to invite their perspective in to the conversation, or you make them feel unwelcome, or you are perceived as always right, because after all, some of us have been taught that white is right. Brown, stick around. Black, get back. then the power that we use is to make, that power is often used to make people invisible or marginalized. When you think you have the only solution to a problem or situation, then that power closes off creativity and it makes an alternate solution unwanted. I don't want to stand up here and to give you the impression that only white folks have homework to do to dismantle their internalized racial support, uh, superiority. Got to keep it real. We who are people of color, we have our own work to do. We also have to examine how our internalized racial oppression how our internalized racial imp uh, imp uh, oppression impacts our relationship with each other. Because for those of us who were born in this country who are people of color or who have been socialized in this country, we have learned and picked up the internalized clear messages about ourselves and our communities. And those messages we have internalized, and they often have a serious impact on our self-esteem. It has a serious impact on our health. It has a serious impact on our relationships with other groups of color. It has an impact on our sense of inferiority, as well as our emotional and mental health. Some of us as people of color have internalized the negative messages related to our own racial groups. And what we oftentimes do is we then also begin to engage in behaviors, behave, begin to behave in, in, in behaviors in which we don't even respect ourselves. While we begin to pull down one another.
We try to change how we look, who we are. Because some of us have been raised in this country that we who have brown and black skin and, and, and hair that is kinky, or that we have lips that are full, or we have backsides that are large, we oftentimes see that in, as a negativity. And we begin to engage in those same kinds of behaviors that are negative. We have been taught oftentimes because we believe we have internalized this racial oppression to stay in our place. And if we stay in our place and do what we're told, everything will be all right. When we express our frustration at always having to try harder, study more, work longer hours, prove our competency, when we start talking about those things, then we are labeled as angry or having issues. It is never ending. It is something that we have to deal with 24 hours, seven days a week. There is no break from this oppression. Truthfully, truthfully speaking, it gets to the point where some of us who are old school can remember the group called the Last Poets. And the Last Poets was a group that said, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. So with both this internalized superiority and with this internalized oppression coexisting, the dance, the dynamic, this dance that happens, how do we begin to create this beloved community? Y'all with me still? That is if we want to create the beloved community. And I say if, because it demands consistency, intentionality, and a great deal of courage. It's hard work. It's one that will require great efforts, far greater ever than you and I could exert. It is a lifetime requirement of work. Another example of the possibility that a beloved is community is beginning to form is when we see ourselves going down to the border. I not too long ago had the opportunity to go down to the border and to be with my brothers and sisters. And I wanted them to see and to know that people who look like me also are in solidarity with them. We are in the same struggle together. When I see folks going down to El Paso, when I see even students who, are on, who go on these alternate spring breaks, I'm not sure you all have them here, when we go to different places or we go to different uh, countries or we even stay here within the country and go to places where people have less than. And we want to reach out. That can't help but break your heart because it breaks my heart. Because I say, why is it so hard for some folks to make it and thrive and others to just survive. All of these activities, my sisters and brothers, are only part of the solution. They are important acts of charity. 
but are they acts of justice? They are important acts of charity, but are they acts of justice? Charity, I suggest, fosters temporary relief. It creates a, a good feeling for those who are engaged in it. And those who are the recipients of it get a little relief and a little respite. However, when one begins to look at systems, this is where justice comes into play. Looking at systems and how those systems, are they just systems or are they systems of charity that put a Band-Aid on something for a minute? Do you and I have the courage to examine systems and to realize that they are purposely constructed to keep certain communities from thriving? Our refusing to look at these systems makes us complicit for the injustices they perpetuate. I'm going to say that again. Our refusing to look at these systems make us complicit for the injustices they perpetuate. And looking at your website, I see that you, you, you go out and you seem to tutor uh, uh, the students at St. Martin de Porres Academy. Wonderful. It's great that you are also be ab being able to lend your expertise, your skills, your support in helping to empower those young people. But I question and I, my challenge to you is, do you ever wonder why they have to work so hard to, to keep hold of the dreams that they are entitled to? Why do they have so much more to contend with and overcome than you and yes, I? What I am challenging you tonight and inviting you to consider is do you have the courage to be transformed? I'm not saying changing, because one can always turn and go back if changing things don't work, right? I'm talking about transformation, for transformation is very different. For there's no turning back once you have put your hand to the plow. You will be transformed if you begin the lifetime journey of dismantling the unearned internalized privileges you live with that breed such devastating effects. You will be transformed if you begin to dismantle the unearned internalized oppression that we live with that continues to breed oppression. You will be transformed if while your mind and heart acknowledge your complicity in these systems, you come to realize with your whole being that you are more than these systems hold out to tantalize you. You are more than what these systems hold out. You are good, we are good, generous, compassionate, men and women who are passionate about life, about belonging, about learning, and we are all worthy of love. For this beloved community is being actualized, as I see it, by a great many of our young adults. For I see our young adults as people who speak up, sign up, put up, and show up. For there are no definite maybes in the beloved community. There are no definite maybes in the beloved community. And no one can be a little bit committed. You can't be a little bit committed 
to radical transformation. It don't work like that. And you and I both know that this beloved community did, that, did not just pop up when Dr. King lived and, di and died. It's been around for generations of people who could not stand idle and quiet in the face of injustice. Today, it is manifested in the desires and actions of our elder generation who want to pass on the torch of justice to us, to you, young adults, a new generation. These are the folks who demonstrated, got arrested, wrote op-eds, protested, wrote about, spoke about, lived and died for peace with justice. These are the women and men who will not give up until all are free. None of us are free until all of us are free. It is one of my own sisters, Dorothy Stang, who 15 years ago was murdered in the Amazon in Brazil because the greed of multinational corporations were raping the rainforests and denying the human rights of people, and she would not keep quiet. Her voice must continue in the voices of the people and in the voice of, of, of ourselves. There are thousands of unsung heroes and heroines in New Haven who have not gained the, the, the who have not gained celebrity status, but nonetheless, they live and die for justice. What about you? In your chosen field of concentra uh, concentration, are you making connections with what is happening with these made poor by unjust economic systems and disparities in health care? If not, why not? Are you present for demonstrations for civil and human rights for all people? If not, why not? Are you part of the Poor People's Campaign, the Black Lives Matter movement? Are you concerned if those who work at Yale are earning just wages and have healthy working conditions and benefits? If not, why not? Are you speaking up and standing with the Dreamers and DACA young students? If not, why not? Are you advocating for the immigrant and refugee community? If not, why not? Are you concerned about the disproportionate number of black and brown women and men incarcerated in our prison system? If not, why not? We know that uh, mass incarceration has been termed the new Jim Crow. Are you willing to work through messy moments that arise in all relationships, seeking, seeking reconciliation and not retaliation? If not, why not? Are you the least bit concerned that Yale University, and I, like I said, I got to speak the true truth, and I know I might not be coming back, but it's all right. But are you the least bit concerned that Yale University is located in the third wealthiest state, and yet New Haven is the second poorest city in Connecticut? If not, why not? Yale is also a, sell, a silo, buying up property all over the city. But my question is, what contributions is Yale making to local neighborhoods? Not charity. Justice, does that concern you? If not, why not? Look at the disparities when you cross Dixel Avenue, Broadway and Dixel Avenue. Are you conscious of the major disparities that you see going north on Dixel Avenue? When I was a kid growing up here, that was the line of demarcation. 
we knew that we could not cross on this side. Why? Those should be concerns to all of us. The beloved community does not exist in a vacuum, nor will it happen without great effort. The effort will be exerted if you begin to question the traditional values that keep unjust systems in place and using your moral imagination to engage in creating transformational values that will change systems and provide greater access for all people to thrive. My suggestion would be instead of the binary thinking of either or and majority rules, which is efficient, less time consuming, and it works, but I would suggest that we begin operating out of a both and way of thinking. One which involves people, it's messier, it takes longer, but it's more effective in the long run since the buy-in is greater and everyone feels a part of the decision-making process. Instead of looking at resources as finite, never having enough, very scarce, begin operating out of, out of a model of abundance where enough there is where there is enough for everyone with the key being the equal the equal distribution according to need and not want systems that operate out of a secrecy model thrive only on having certain individuals to know, which as you experience, as we experience, breeds tension, unholy alliances, ruptures relationships, and creates an environment of suspicion. I would suggest begin instead with a model of accountability that reverences confidentiality and that one is accountable to all for the sake of the common good. Lastly, a model based on competition keeps people at odds with one another and vibing for the top spots. Begin looking at the benefits of a model based on corporation, cooperation and the culture of an office, classroom, or department begins to change drastically. As I mentioned, this calls for radical transformation. In conclusion, the, the beloved community is not an impossible dream. As long as there are those of us who love no matter the cost, who have the courage to question, who believe that the world is bigger than our individual perspectives, who are bold enough and courageous enough to follow the Jesus who lived and died because Jesus had an impossible dream, that of the liberation of all people. Peace. I'm out. I, I just want to say a shout out to my homegirl, uh, Sister Rose Mary, Mary, Rose Mary Reynolds, we're both sisters of Notre Dame de Mimura. We both went to St. Mary's and we both grew up in the, in the, in the hood. She's, she's, at Al at, right, she's at Albertus Magnus College. What up, bro? <laughs> Thank you so much for both inspiring and challenging us. Uh, you talk about radical transformation. I'm just wondering if there was a moment or a few moments in your own life that you could talk about in terms of your own transformation. And we'll have time for a few other questions. Um, yes, certainly. These lights are all in my eyes, so I really can't see. But uh, certainly one of the, oh, I that's right. I'm supposed to stay in front of this is being live streamed. I'm sorry. Um, 
as I mentioned, uh, one of the most uh, radical transformations for me, again, was when I had the opportunity to go to the border. And I was in Nogales, Mexico. And the men, women, and children, uh, and Nogales, Mexico, it's a, it's a site where they come uh, to receive um, uh, supplies and clothing and, and, and food, et cetera. And it's also a place where we then work with those um, men, women, and children to get them in, in touch with their families and help them to get on the trains and buses and airplanes to go to go where their families were. That was a major uh, trans transforming experience for me because when the bus pulled up, the first thing I noticed on the bus was that the windows were all darkened. So these men, women, and children, they had no idea even where they were being brought to. Then when they got off the bus, the first thing I noticed was shackles. Um, uh, you know, um, shackles that you put on prisoners, you know, on their, on their legs and stuff. And they were frightened. The fear that I saw in the children's faces, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the men and women's faces, many of them not even being able to speak English um, and just wondering where, where are we? What is going to happen to us next? And to, to go back and think that our administration calls these folks thugs, murderers, rapists, and yet these men, women, and children were, are, are, were there so we could embrace them, so we could offer a meal so we could pray together. And that just, it brought me to tears, quite honestly. Um, and so for me, that was, that was, a, that was a, ra a radical experience. And I think, the, like I said, the other thing I was there, and I wanted them to understand, that black and brown people who look like them, we may not be able to be at the border. You know, because we might not have the funds, we can't take time off of work, et cetera. But I wanted them to know that we are in solidarity with them and that our, our plight is their plight. And so that was, a, that was one of the moments for me that was um, very difficult. Now, when I got into Nogales, um, I, I, I also uh, had trouble getting out. Uh, simply because I, I looked like many of the, the folks that were there. Um, and if it, wasn't be, if it was not for the fact that I was with, with my, uh, my, relig my other religious sisters, who happened to be white, I'm not so certain I would have got out. I'm just keeping it real. So now, any questions that you have? I'm, you know, I'll try to answer. Okay, it looks like Mr. Lars' group will uh, join for other conversation okay. afterwards. Thank you so much for crossing Dixwell Avenue and Thank coming you. down. We'll have a conversation up in the rig study for anybody who'd like to join for further conversation. Thanks.